Hi, this is Bettina Carey, founder of Women in Small Biz Shows and Events, and I'm here today with none other than Erin Birch. I feel so empowered, and I'm actually a little bit giddy because I get to interview her for the upcoming Women's Empowerment Summit coming up on September the 9th, where, she'll, where she will be sharing her story and her mother's story, and I cannot wait to hear what she has to say. Laurel embodied courage without compromise and used her insatiable desire to be a part of all humanity and to enable people to feel good about themselves. I was lucky enough to meet Laurel before she passed away in 2007, and I'm now honored to be able to interview her daughter, Erin. Laurel was aware before she passed of the legacy that she wanted to leave, and Erin has accepted both the duty and the responsibility to keep her mother's expression of love for all humanity alive in perpetuity. Erin, who has her own story of breaking through her own glass ceiling, will share what it is to, like to be growing up the daughter of a renowned artist who took her work to international acclaim. Being a vehicle for transformation, whether a filmmaker, or teaching dance or martial arts, she is a force to be sure. Together, we will be discussing what it's been like for her to both preserve the communication that her mother left on the planet, but also to live out her life as an empowered woman. Welcome, Erin, it's so great to have you here today. Oh, it's so great to be here. What a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. Um, so I would like to kick off our um, talk today by asking you a number of questions, one of which is why, after being a filmmaker for 23 years, did you choose to take on the Laurel Birch legacy so fully? Mm, that's a great question. I'm still trying to figure that out. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it evolves, it evolves all, you know, all the time. Um, you know, my mom died in 2007, and after she passed, you know, I've, I've been an artist all my life, and that's come up in different ways as a filmmaker, as a dancer, as a martial artist, um, as a ceramicist. And when my mom passed, uh, her, there, I knew I had to um, preserve it. Not only you know, it'd be one thing to just say, well, I'm just going to continue exactly what she did. And, you know, because I want to make sure everybody has access to it. That was part of it. But it was really, I came to it knowing that her messages were so similar to my own messages. That, I mean, I remember one day going, oh my God, I've lived my life you know, wanting to inspire people, wanting people to feel loved and seen and beautiful and, you know, whether it be through dance and come on, go for it, you know, yeah, shake grass, you know, really like cut loose or martial, art, martial arts and finding your full and absolute power. Um, that in, with my mom's art, it was, you know, she created this art that when you see it, it makes you feel good. And um, she wanted you to feel good. She wanted you to feel loved and seen. And I thought, wow, okay, so her art is, does that. I love her art. It's beautiful. I want to share it. If I step into this position, I can do the art that I want to do. Also, I can, I can be looking at her designs and thinking, how do I transform that design, make it maybe relevant today, which is not that hard. Her work has just stayed so it just amazes me. I look at something and I go, oh my God, this looks like it could have been totally created today. And it's 40 years ago that she made, did that painting, for example. So when I recognized that the messages were very similar to what I wanted to share in the world, I thought, yeah, I want to take this on. And taking it on meant, you know, being in business with business people, doing things I had never done in my life, doing contracts and, you know, um, doing product development, but I get to work with her designs and put them on new things and have them, um, you know, 
get into new people's hands. The collectors that have collected her work for 40 and 50 years and the kids that are just discovering her and going, oh my God, this is so cool. I don't know what it is, but I love it. Well, yeah. I'm one of those uh, folks that have been collecting Laurel Birch for 40 years and I have a number of really great pieces and I actually just have to say it's a faux pas on my part not to have one on but my ear broke so I'm not able to put oh. any of my jewelry on. <laughs> well, look, I don't either but I do have a little original painting behind me. So. Oh wonderful wonderful yes uh, her art really inspired me and there was a time in my life when I actually was working with um, a, a publisher who had been granted a license to use the Laurel Birch art on the product that I was selling at the time. And it was a prenatal education material oh, yeah. and then subsequently zero to three years of life. Yeah. And uh, that's how I came to know Laurel uh, even more in depth and ended up in Sausalito where she had her store and got a chance to meet her and got a chance to really see the artistic expression. But what's interesting, as I was preparing for your interview, I really discovered more of the fact that she had messages that she was trying to communicate for all the world to know and to come together. And given that the story these days is that we have to come together, I do think her pieces are timeless. And I think her messages and her art and the collection that you've managed to keep alive and well and thriving is just a phenomenal testimony to both your mother and to you, Erin. And I wanna thank you, myself as a patron, for, for embodying this work because it truly is a work of art that should live into perpetuity. Thank you. I mean, Thank you. I, I, every time someone says that, I, I take that in so deeply because I know I'm doing good, good work, you know? Yes, absolutely. And, and I wanted absolutely. to speak to what you just said about, because it's, my mother is evolving for me also as a woman, you know, I'm 55 years old. She died when she was 62 um, in 2007. And, um, you know, she was, her messages included very much so wanting to make sure people that, um, her messages really included wanting to make sure that people felt connected. And that's what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about that, how she, how that was such a strong, um, it was a very profound purpose for her. She really wanted to make sure people felt loved, seen, and felt their interconnectedness. And I thought, I wonder why that is the thing that's most important. And I do realize that it was because she didn't feel like she fit in a lot. And some of that was being this, you know, this white woman who, you know, was born in 1945, did not feel like she fit in her, in her family very well. And um, so she found in other cultures she would try to connect over here, try to connect over here, and wanted people to feel that connection. So her paintings were that. And it was, yes, of course, she wanted people to feel connected. But of course, you know, it's like, see me, love me, and I want you to feel loved. I want you to feel seen. And that as a, you know, coming to that more on a deeper level at this time in my life is really profound because when I was younger and she had a line around the block at Macy's and she was sitting and signing autographs, it's just, it, it can appear as, oh, I want you to all know how beautiful and wonderful you are. But then there's also the piece of, you know, I want to be loved and cherished for just for who I am, you know? So it's all of it, but it's, it's, I just think it's, it's, it, the messages are absolutely today, you know, that we have got to be connected and recognize that we are the same, that we are, that we are, we should love one another. We should connect. How dare us not? How dare us not? Yes, I can totally relate. And, and, you know, that, an interesting thing, you know, again, just doing a little research on Laurel's life, I bumped into was that she left as a teenager 
and she lived with nuns. And I had a similar experience living with nuns. And um, they sat, they were my salvation, you know. So she left home early. Um, you, as you, your father, she met her, your father, a black man living in the 60s when at that time it was even illegal to have an interracial marriage. Um, what would that have been like for her and to be able to raise children in that environment? Uh, can you share a little bit about what it was like to grow up as a black little girl in the society that we have had then, but also that we still so much have today? Yeah, well, when you, you know, when you're first come into the world, you don't know what that means. What does black mean? What does white mean? Right? I mean, this is my mom. You know, this is my mom. Uh, you know, oh, I look different than my mom. I remember uh, my mom would tell me this story. She said one time I saw this little brown bird, you know, over in the, you know, on a tree, this little brown bird. And I was like four years old or something. And my mom said, said that I said, mom, look, that little bird looks brown like me, you know, like starting to identify, oh, I'm not, you're my mom and I love you and we are bonded and I am different than you are, you know, and my um, mom and my dad divorced when I was really young, so my father wasn't around very much. Um, so I just thought, you know, when you said, what was it like? It's like, I don't know, it's like being me when you're, when you're really little, you just don't know. And then you start to realize, you know, my mom set me up for, you can do anything and everything, because of course, one, she's a white woman, very inspired, very passionate. So she's just like, go, oh, you know, I thought by 12 years old, I was washed up because I didn't have my own company. And I kid you not. I really, I remember the day I had a conversation with her and she was like, well, you could start your own business, you know? <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. And I got all excited. And I literally remember walking out the door. We lived on Sac Sacramento and Fulmore in San Francisco. I was 12, 12. And I walked out the front door and I was like, yeah. And I stood there and I was like, I don't know how to start a business. <laughs> A business, you know, I mean, you know, and it was something like make these little cards to sell or something, but that she was very, very driven. And I definitely thought by the time I was 18 and 20 and didn't have my own business, forget it. You know, I was washed up because that woman was driven, you know, but I've um, digressed a bit. Um, yes, my mom did um, go to, you know, school to a Catholic school and the story that I heard was she would play music for the nuns and she was always thinking outside of the box. She would, you know, she would um, leave and climb out the window and go see my father, a black man, right? Um, and, then, and then sneak back in. But, and the nuns all just thought she was, she didn't get in trouble. Like she was just kind of, um, just kind of this wild spirit that they absolutely loved, but she didn't last there very long. <laughs> <laughs> and I think her, you know, getting away from, she was really trying to get away from my dad, from her father, who was very, very strict. And she went and she did the worst thing you could possibly do. And I'm sure she didn't think of it that way. But when you look back, it was the worst thing. She went and she married a black man you know, and had a brown baby, gosh forbid. And um, so, uh, and just to bring that back around that, you know, she really raised me that, you know, you can do whatever you want, you know. And then, of course, I go and do my first interview and then I realize, oh, no, I can't, you know. I mean, I, they are not looking at me the same as they are looking at a white person and I'm getting it reflected back. But it's very interesting when you're just going along when you're really young. My mom is, loves me. She's like, you can do anything. And I'm like, oh, wait, I'm brown. I can't do anything. These people are treating me a different way. And then you start to recognize, okay, this is, this is my own challenge. And that starts to separate, started to separate me from my mother. You know, our experiences were different for sure. Yeah, I can only imagine. I, I'm a woman of color myself. And, uh, you know, as life would have it, you know, I've had my share of racist types of experiences sure. and um, doors that have not been opened. Um, and uh, 
one of the doors that did get opened was when I was entering into college at the University of Washington and they had a minority affairs department. And thankfully, you know, they embraced me, they wrapped their arms around me, they put me through a lot of um, support and I ended up graduating from the School of Nursing as a result of their assistance. Mm -hmm. But with, if not for that program, I doubt I would have ended up in college let alone being able to make it through college because of the support that they gave me. And uh, again, being a woman of color, I was Puerto Rican and my parents really never thought of necessarily thinking like put money towards college. Let's get our kids to college or anything like that back then. I'm 62. So I can relate to, you know, a lot of what you have lived through. So uh, turning a little bit to, I'm just really curious how it was for you growing up, knowing that your mom was, you know, going from bootstrapping, uh, being a bootstrapping entrepreneur into a very successful and seasoned businesswoman. What was that like? Uh, what were you, you mentioned you were rebelling a little bit. Were you involved in the business at the time or were you alone? Well, um, when I was yeah, probably 18, I uh, I always was involved in some way or another when I was 12. I didn't start my own business yet, but I did put ear wires on earrings and made a dollar an hour or something. And, you know, I had to every day do an hour of uh, putting earring, ear, ear wires on earrings. So I started at, at a young age. And then through the years, um, I set up trade shows and worked in booths and um, did different events with my mother and was always around, but I, you know, growing up, you know, I remember buying things with food stamps, you know, I remember going to the store and getting some milk with, you know, with food stamps. And, and then um, later, you know, in the, in the early seventies, things starting to change mid seventies where there was more cash and there was, you know, and my mother had a nice Jaguar and, you know, all of a sudden people, her jewelry was, you know, we'd watch the news and, you know, uh, Valerie Coleman would have my mom's earrings on and we, and we get a call that um, Cher just walked into a store in LA and bought two pairs of earrings and we would watch that show every night to see, you know, and then eventually she wore the earrings on the show and, oh. you know, she really, um blew up and and i mean her jewelry was everywhere and um and she was very well received and you know bright you know just her own woman here she comes in this magenta and teal and and um it was and so in those years she was traveling a lot and that was very challenging for me that was the part that was really hard because the world was seeing my mom as she started to get successful and we're talking about a large i'm jumping around a bit but you know they started to see her as very successful and she was getting more and more um uh, recognized and she was on tv and different things and i'm feeling like okay well she's just my mom you know and those years were hard she was so driven and so passionate that that um it took her away from me and from my brother you know and she thought it would be great to give us a lot of freedom and what we needed was some structure right <laughs> so, you know she was a kind of parent she'd say okay when you come home i want you to come home and i want you to do your homework right away and so you know i go okay i know what i'm doing i get home and i get ready to do my homework and she'd say what are you doing and i and i'd say well i'm doing my homework and she said no no we're going to mexico you're going to learn more in Mexico than you were learning going to school. <laughs> Just forget that. And then we'd go to Mexico. And, and it was true that I would learn all these different things, but I also lacked being able to have the structure and spent the next 20 years trying to make that work. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. I'm harkened back to the time when I was raising my own son and I doing my own thing because I've been a business owner since the nineties and he would be just standing next to me at a Kinko store as I was copying or you know, renting their computer time or variety of things like that. And now if I say I'm going to Kinko's or I'm going here <laughs> to do copying or staples or anything like that, he's like, I'm out of here, mom. I ain't doing any of that with you anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it really, it, it shifted later in her life, but I mean, my 20s and 30s, I was kind of stuck, or not stuck in, my path was, I'm going to set, you know, I'm going to be my own woman, you know, I'm going to, you know, do, and she was very, of course, you know, supportive of that, and always then was very helpful in me starting my own business and different things, and, um, you know, I was a, a filmmaker, and, you know, loved the power of film, and including, messages and you know art and dance and doing something technical and something that was really my own and my own voice and it was it was really great i remember you know i'd have a screening and then my mother would come to the screening and then you know i was always laurel birch's daughter and this was this time it was this oh that's aaron birch's mother you know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it was like you know um the roles had reversed it was very sweet for both of us to yeah. she was so honoring and celebratory of me and absolutely supportive and i'm so glad that before she passed it, you know that we just came to such a uh, an appreciation and love for each other i mean we always got well no i wouldn't say we always got along we always had a deep love for one another no question about it was she there for me? Was she present? No. A lot of the time, she really wasn't. I mean, she was, and it took me a long time to realize that that wasn't because she didn't love, it wasn't that she didn't love me, but, you know. It was that she was really passionate and really, and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't occur to her. I mean, later she said, you know, I just didn't realize, like, it seems obvious for some people, but like that I needed to tell you I loved you and I needed to, you know, be more disciplined. I thought freedom and, you know, and you should, of course I love you, you know, and thank God we came to that later. Yeah, that's great that you had that opportunity. I, I was watching a video this morning of you with your mom rubbing her feet as she's telling her story. And for those people that are watching here, um, tell us a little bit about what evolved for her in her health and her medical care that sure, sure, resulted sure. in her passing. Yeah, so she was born with a very rare bone disease called osteopetrosis. And osteopetrosis is when people know osteoporosis more when your bones are very brittle. But my mom's bones were very dense. And if you don't have give in your bones, they also can break and snap. So mm -hmm. she had numerous, numerous breaks. I mean, the first one when she was roller skating, you know, you're roller skating and just with your foot up and from the weight of the skate, her femur um, cracked. It. I think she was seven. I mean, she, I mean, she might have broke her arm first, but it got to the point where she'd broken her right leg four or five times or left three times. And, you know, she would, you'd shake her hand and her hand would break. You'd hug her and her rib would go. I mean, she was very, very fragile. And after having you know, but she was a fireball. I mean, she was on fire, right? So yeah. she was in a constant mode of, uh, I used to think of it as she was always breaking, right? But then I realized she was always healing. You know, she was breaking, but she was always in, the breaking happens fairly quickly. The healing is a long process. So she would design, design, design. And I think she realized that she had to kind of live her life to the fullest. That might've been the video that you saw where she says, I lived my life to the fullest. I love it when she says it because the doctor would say, don't ride horses, don't do this. And she was like, no, I'm riding horses. In fact, I'm going to do it naked like Lady Godiva. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, she did all kinds of things she wasn't supposed to do. I mean, she really lived her life to the fullest. And I think she must have known she wasn't going to live forever. So she, you know, and I think we all knew that this disease was going to be the thing that caught up with her. Yeah. And that, um, you know, once it's hard to heal from those, from all those breaks and, and the pain was a lot. You know, and I think after a while, the pain started to win, you know, be more than the yeah. ability to heal. So her, her premature death um, closed her life out, but then it opened up another door for you to walk through. Uh, was it an easy venture? Was it something that took some time? I remember a time there where it seemed like I couldn't find Laurel Birch to purchase. 
And then all of a sudden now I'm seeing it everywhere again. So you're doing a masterful job. Thank you. Um, well, when she passed, um, my brother had actually taken on the business and he was kind of working with it. He was doing his own part of the Laurel Birch business for a while. And then, um, he, you know, thank goodness, he, as my mom was ill, he kept it all afloat. You know, he kept it going because I was completely about my mom. You know, there's, I was not, I wouldn't have been able to run the business. And certainly after she passed, I don't even remember like that year, couple years, especially that year. I remember looking up and kind of like what happened and it was just devastating. So interesting, you know, this morning I got in my car and, and I have my, my music playing, you know, and it's on random. And all of a sudden, and I, I love them, can share this with you today. It was on random and all of a sudden I heard my mom's voice. And I've been working on a film about my mother for many years, and I kind of put it on hold as I'm running the business. It's taken me a long time to really throw myself into it. But there was an interview that I did with her in probably 2006, the year before she died. And she was reading a letter about one of her tri trips to um, Bali. And she was just telling me what the room was like and how she set it up. And it was, you know, so unexpected and like a visit from her and you know hearing her laugh and us laugh together What's the likelihood that you'd be in listening and then that voice from the past to come through that would be statistically like um, impossible i mean it just i mean i wow in the in the even the track it does it's just a bunch of numbers it doesn't say interview with mom or anything and it was just you know yeah. So I woke up in Bali and out the window were these lotuses and you know I mean just it was just this beautiful wow. and then she said oh let me do it again and then <laughs> do you see the the lotus in my branding oh, absolutely and of course I have lots of color because I was so inspired by your mom's art I had to have a lot of color and I had to have the feminine presence that she had in that product that I sold and all the more feminine characters. I know she was really loved and adored also for her cats. Um, oh, and so yeah. there was a, there's a lot of cats out there and a lot of cat lovers. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I have some cat stories. I, I, I feel like I lost my, I was saying something that I wanted to finish the point and I can't remember what it was. Um, oh. It's okay. It had uh, to do with her, her coming to visit you in your car possibly. <laughs> No, I, I, have, I appreciate being able to think about that again. Oh, well, it was just the, about, um, you know, choosing and taking on the business and, and, you know, that transition, you know, I'm grateful, like I said, to my brother who was able to be kind of business minded and kind of kept things afloat. And then after kind of digesting it all a few years later, it's like, wow, I really want to participate in getting her messages and her work out there. You know, like I said in the beginning of the interview, it was an opportunity for me to work with art, which I absolutely love. You know, be able to be in creating, work with people, be, be able to use her messages, which were getting to the same thing that I wanted to, know your worth, know how beautiful you are, um, it was like, oh my God, I can do all of those, all of the things I had done in my life, it felt like led me to this. And I'm frankly, and she would have been surprised that I took this on, absolutely. Because I was like, I'm my own person, you know, and she kept kind of like, well, don't you want to? And I was like, no, no, I don't know. And so she never knew that I took this on. I mean, now she knows in the divine, but you know, it, it I had to be clear that taking it on wasn't just doing my, like a duty or, I mean, I really, this is a very important thing for me to express because that wouldn't have been good. And sometimes I think people do see that. They go, oh, that's so great. It's like, oh, you're just living through your whole life is about your mom. It is, but it's, um, there's something about, I'm so in it. I mean, it's so me and it's so an opportunity to, uh, pass on the messages so beautifully, you know, so succinctly 
and I'm looking out at my, I have a store and I'm looking through in my office out at the socks and the mugs and the bags and the jewelry. And I, I, I every day I look out over here because I haven't had it that long. And I'm just like, it's stunning. I, I am stunned by my mother's work and how I've maintained it and kept it going. It, it it's the greatest job. More of a curator at this point. But it's great. What was that? You're more of a curator yeah. at this point. Um, and your collection of art and works really uh, with the, uh, all the, the weightiness of that, what that entails because it was your mother, but also for the, those of us that are the fans, those of us that have adorned ourselves with the art felt better and more fully empowered by yeah. putting it on, gifting it to one another, which I've done dozens of times. My mom wears her horse socks. I have a similar pair. I know when my mom passes that I will inherit her socks and I can walk the more <laughs> miles that are left. And if something should happen to me, vice versa, she, yeah. she knows my whole sock story. <laughs> you know, I actually have already put a pouch together with my jewelry for a friend who is an avid supporter in the event of my untimely demise i say right on there this is for kathy webb <laughs> you know uh, so it's i'm sure i'm not the only person out there uh, who thought I about know. laurel since the day one and even making sure that they don't get thrown out as junk jewelry and thrown into the goodwill pile i want them to be honored and respected even beyond my lifetime and uh and of course now we're talking about gift giving and all the wonderful gifts and uh that might benefit speakers and authors and other people that are in my life and i recently had the opportunity to buy some masks and uh, uh to see the color on instead of the traditional blue or white or black that everybody's yeah, wearing so, right here i've got this oh one. there you go here you go we got a couple uh, I happen to have all these cats. Oh, there you go. And this is like a sneak peek because I didn't even plan on it, but I've got finally horses. They're coming. Oh my gosh. Just, well, you know, and fun stuff. Like I, this is all my mom's designs, but like you said, it is like being a curator that I really get to pick and choose, you know, some of the things that I want to bring forward. Yes. I think that your store is like a museum. Yeah. And, uh, it, but it's a museum and gift store all in one, <laughs> you know, it reminds me of when I went to see Cezanne, you know, in the East Coast and, and then I went into the gift shop and then I got to take some of the work home, right? And it's the same, yeah. it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, it I is. Go to a store and be shopping like in a tourist spot and all of a sudden it's Laurel Birch and it's like, yeah. see ya, wouldn't want to be ya because I'm going to be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I want this this space to be. I moved into a new office on March fifteenth. Perfect March, timing. Perfect, perfect timing. timing. <laughs> and March fifteenth, everything closed down, and um, you know this was gonna. This is my offices where I do the licensing from, and where we pick and pack and fulfill and everything. And and then I wanted you to have this gallery experience and be able to see some of the original paintings. And you know, if it wasn't my computer, I would take you around. We can do that another time. But just to be able to see an original painting and then the mug that came from that painting and the earrings and the journal, it really, you know, my mom created that art and thought. I want to give that art. I want to give that away. I want, I want, she wasn't, it wasn't the other way around where, okay, let's make some mugs and let's just find something to put on the mug. Let's make, you know, she wasn't in the business of making mugs. She was in the business of, I want people to feel good every day. How can I give them this piece of art and have it be right there? And I'm telling you to this day, 40, I mean, I get people almost daily telling me, I still drink every morning. Everyone knows that's my mug. Don't even touch my mug or those are my earrings. People, someone just yesterday, they send me their collection of jewelry and I love looking at them and they know I love it. I feel like part of my job is to be the listening for people to tell their Laurel Birch story because I genuinely care, but I really take it on as a, position as well 
you know, I mean, we all want to be heard. Like, I really care about that story. I, I am ooing and aahing. My mother, I mean, my, my mom's sister just sent me, this is, these are, she said, there's no place else that, that these should go back to you. These early pieces. Wow. She's actually, she said, so I noticed you were you're interested in my jewelry when you came to visit. And she said, is there any reason? And I said, I just want to have it. I want to eat it for one. It's like, it's like, and I said, I want to preserve it. You know, I want people to be able to see it. I want to, I don't even have every single thing. It's like, I, someone brought me the cutest thing. This, this little guy that is oh, a little horse. I have not seen this. It's a, it's a, a pin. I hadn't seen this in years. I love it when people, because I will treasure it. I'll display it in the cases and, you know, God, it's like, I sound like I like what I do. I do. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. I'm loving that you like what you do and love what you do, really. So, I do. I wanted I'm to add so, a piece, though. I'm, yeah. I, I'm so I, excited to have you at the Women's Empowerment Summit, where we're going to be talking a little bit further about what it's like to be an entrepreneur, to break through your own glass ceiling, unlock your hidden secrets with your master key. And um, I, I, if you would leave a comment here at the end, a little bit about why you're uh, being a part of the summit, that would be great. Share a little bit about your interest in being a part of the summit. Yeah, I, I hope that what, something that I can share on that day will just inspire someone else to oh, I think my story is important. I want them to, people to feel like, oh, what I have to say is important. Oh, I can do that. Oh, I am gonna, I don't, I'm not that great of a painter, but maybe I should, you know, go for it. And maybe it could be on a mug at some point or whatever <laughs> it is, whatever the passion is, whether you're a poet or whether you're, you know, the entrepreneur, it's like we all need that, that to be, that, uh, unlocked or we need permission unfortunately some some of us you know i just want to massage that area that we all need um to listen deeply to yourself and to go for it and so if there's some way that i can share my mother's story and the hard parts welfare to the rags to riches and kind of back to the middle again you know, or, you know, whatever, or that I later took on this business and then was inspired at this age. And I'm now looking at how I can make this business relevant in a time of Black Lives Matter and COVID. And how do I take something that was my mom's messages and business and go, okay, I'm a Black woman solidly in that. And I have some things to say. I am committed to the, to my mom's art and I still get to use those as the messages but now it's things that I have to say, you know? So I hope that um, it will inspire people to do their thing. I mean, really, that is yeah. it done for me. <laughs> One little thing I say, someone go, ooh, ooh. So how can people get some of your uh, art in real time? Either yeah. your store is the location, if you can give it, as well as, uh, your online store. Sure. sure. So my, um, my, my store, my website is laurelbirchstudios.com. I'll say it again. It's a laurel, L-A-U-R-E-L, birchstudios.com. And you can, you can write me as well, Aaron, A-A-R-I-N, which is a different spelling because my mother was an artist. Um, and I just, my, my new gallery, spaces in Berkeley, California at 1345 8th Street in Berkeley. And I would love for you to contact me and, you know, come through or order online, shoot me an email, tell me your Laurel Birch story. And, you know, and how we as, uh, really interested in how we as women, especially with you, Bettina, I'm really excited about getting to know you and, and our conversation that we had, gosh, nine months ago or a year ago, maybe even a couple. I, I lost track of yeah. time, but I, I knew that we were going to come back around again. And I'm so grateful. Like the timing is so good. And I'm just, I'm really excited to be supporting what you're doing and to be able to share what I'm about at this 
at this new pivotal point in my in my life and in my career. I can't wait to hear more from you. And yes, we are connected. And uh, if you're interested in joining us at the Women's Empowerment Summit, join us on September the 9th, 8.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Visit us on the web at womensempowermentmarketplace.com and or you can text us at 555-888, uh, the word women, and we'll put you on our mailing list. Thank you, Erin. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. I look forward to uh, the summit with you. Bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>